chapter 13 is over aggression, uh, kind of about how aggression originates, um, how it causes us to change our behavior and social situations and kind of the impact of aggression, um, how aggression changes from culture to culture. And um, so, yeah, so let's get into chapter 13. So there's a few situational determinants of aggression. So I'm going to talk about two different kinds of aggression um, and kind of what the situation calls for. So there's hostile aggression and instrumental aggression. Hostile aggression is behavior motivated by feelings of anger and hostility where the primary aim is to harm another physically or psychologically. Um, you're not going to gain anything from this. This is simply to harm someone else for whatever reason. And then instrumental aggression is behavior that is intended to harm another in the service of motives other than pure hostility. Like you don't want to hurt someone just to hurt someone, but you're, you want, you're willing to hurt someone to gain something for yourself, um, such as to gain status, attract attention, acquire wealth. So maybe you throw someone under the bus metaphorically to get ahead or your um so that would be like emotional or um professional aggression um physical aggression it could be you're in a basketball game and you throw your elbows and hit someone so you can either catch a foul or score a point or get the ball whatever it is um there's a point to it you don't want to you're not just going to elbow someone to elbow them um you're going to elbow them to get ahead in the game. So um, instrumental is you're using the aggression as an instrument to, to get what you want. And then hostile aggression is just to get back at someone or to cause them harm for whatever reason, but you're not going to get anything in return. So according to research, there are situations that may predispose people to aggression. Um, we're going to talk about several different things. I want you to keep keep these in mind um, and, and keep track of all these because these for sure will be on, on the final. So according to research, these are there are situations that may predispose people to aggression. That doesn't mean that they for sure will act out aggressively, but this makes them more likely to be aggressive. So the first is, is heat. People have long believed that moods and actions are closely tied to the weather, such as calling someone boiling hot or steaming mad. Um, this is the only one that doesn't really have any evidence to back it up, but it's just, you know, this may predispose someone to being aggressive. Next is media violence. Uh, there are several studies that showed people who consumed a violent movie or other violent media were more likely to commit violent acts upon others, although this is not 100% reliable. Just because you you watch uh, violent media, to consume violent media, that does not mean you're, you yourself are going to be a violent or hostile or aggressive person, but it just increases the likelihood. So under... Um, media violence. I'm not including violent video games. That is its own thing. And there's a reason why that I'm going to get into. So violent video games, the number of hours that youths are spending per week playing video games is showing that they are addicted. Playing video games gives kids a high and they feel withdrawal symptoms when they don't play. So that alone can increase the, the predisposition, predisposition to aggression but what is the difference between watching a violent movie and playing a violent video game? In a violent video game, you are doing the acting. You are you are playing a role in it. You're not just watching. You are actively doing it uh, with a controller. Um, so that can also make a difference between consuming violent media and engaging in violent media, if that makes sense. Uh, next, um, social rejection can predispose someone to aggression. Social rejection activates threat defense systems that involve fight or flight cardi and cardiovascular arousal. Uh, this arousal includes the release of the stress hormone cortisol and feelings of distress and pain and defensive aggressive tendencies. When you kind of feel like your back is up against the wall, you have really no other option 
but to fight, to, to get people off your back, to prove yourself, to do whatever. And so people that feel socially rejected, they may lash out aggressively. Um, and this is why, because it, it, it releases these, um, these hormones in your body that, that make you feel stressed, which therefore affect your thinking and your blood pressure and, um, your, just like your mental clarity and, um, it can, it can cause you to do things that maybe you normally wouldn't do. Income inequality is next. Something that you maybe wouldn't think of, but it kind of falls in along the lines of the social rejection. So in countries characterized by high economic inequality, such as Venezuela, South Africa, and even the United States, the average citizen is much more likely murdered, assaulted, or raped than in countries with less economic inequality, such as Japan, Ireland, and Norway. Interesting. Children in countries with greater income inequality are more likely to experience conflict with their peers and to report being victims of bullying kind of goes back to the social rejection that whenever there's a great disparity between um, impoverished children and children from well-off families that are within the school, school same school system, they're in the same classes, um, and, and it's very easy to see those disparities in income, um, it can fuel these powerful feelings of social rejection um, that those at the bottom experience in unequal societies, and that can trigger violence. Um, inequality undermines feelings of well-being, trust, and goodwill among people, which can give rise to frustration, anger, and aggression. So um, I don't know if you remember a few uh, chapters back, we talked about the difference in attribution between um, rich people and um people that are in poverty or, or lower income people. And um, the rich people felt like, well, everyone can just pull themselves up by their bootstraps, that it's all about um, the, you know, how hard you work and anyone can make it there. And then impoverished people, they're like, no, I'm, I'm kind of stuck in this situation. I'm in, no matter how hard I work, it's really hard to get out. And so that can kind of, that those two different ways of thinking can cause um, some tension between the two classes, between lower class and upper class. And um, when it says undermines feelings of well-being, um, people that are impoverished can can start to say or or and lose trust is one, that the system is out to get me. Two, these people are living so well. Um, if they really cared about their fellow man, why wouldn't they help me out? Or um why won't they pave a way for me to get out of this? So it it undermines those feelings of well-being, trust, and goodwill among people as a whole because they become less trusting of people in general because how are how are they working their butts off and still stuck at the bottom when other people work just as hard or not, or you know, maybe not even as hard and they're doing just fine. Um, so that can give rise to frustration, anger, and then aggression saying, I've got to do something um, to close this gap. This is, this is what I can think of to do. Okay. Um, so those are the, the, the ways that people may be predisposed to aggression. Next is the construal processes of aggression. So what, how does aggression uh, make you view the world differently? Or how does an emotion make you view, uh, view the world differently that can then cause aggression? So the first is through anger. Uh, any unpleasant stimulus can trigger a fight, or, a fight or flight response of anger. I remember when we talked about the broaden and build hypothesis, several, some, uh, several chapters ago that it said whenever you're having positive emotions that you're much more likely to broaden your horizons and be social and um you're you're more likely to engage in pro social activity well if you're on the opposite not only are you not in a positive mood you're actually in an angry you're having angry emotions so that would be the opposite of positive so um the stimuli that you run into will be perceived as negative and can trigger trigger these fight or flight responses of anger. 
And it can also cause you to engage in antisocial behavior. So things that are going to cause people to not want to be around you. So once angry, people are more likely to think things are unfair because you've got that negative way of interpreting things um, to perceive others as, as having more combative in intentions. So that would be kind of the antisocial behavior slash antisocial um, lens on how you view your social interactions and, um, and to imagine ways of inflicting harm. So that would be, again, the antisocial behavior. Next is through de dehumanization. So dehumanization is the attribution of non-human characteristics and the denial of human qualities to groups other than one's own. So studies of escalating conflict and genocide regularly find that dehumanization fuels extreme violence because it's easier to harm people when they seem less of a human. So um, if you think about World War II in Nazi Germany and um, you think of how, uh, how the Jews were treated and how they were imprisoned and, um, and brutally murdered, uh, you know, how that was easily done over time was because the people that were inflicting this harm, they were kind of brainwashed to, to dehumanize Jewish people. And they believed that they were less than human. It is much easier to justify uh, hurting someone or killing someone when you don't believe that they are fully human or they are subhuman. It's a lot easier to digest mentally. And so that is what's so scary about dehumanization is that it opens the door for so many um, immoral and inhumane things. Okay, uh, culture and aggression. So how, how do those two play hand in hand? So um, a cultural perspective holds that certain values make members more aggressive and violent than others. So according to um, this culture of honor that, that some countries still uphold, but so, uh, a lot more used to, um, this, these types of cultures of honor are cultures defined by its members' strong concerns about their own and others' reputations, leading to sensitivity to insults and a willingness to use violence to avenge any perceived wrong. So when I think of this, I think of um, Kim Jong-un of uh, North Korea. Um, it is a culture defined by its members' strong concerns about his own and those, I guess, close to his um, reputations, leading to sensitivity to insults and a willingness to use violence to avenge any perceived wrong. And because he has kind of total power, um, then that violence to avenge any perceived wrong can be taken out like that. It can be um, enacted very quickly. So that is a culture of honor. Uh, culture and sexual violence um, also play a huge, um, they, they're very much interconnected. Uh, in certain cultures, female infanticide, infanticide is practiced. Parents are less likely to immunize their daughters or take them to the hospital when they're sick. Um, in certain cultures where um, females just are not seen or deemed as worthy or as um, necessary or as um, wanted as males. Uh, thousands of young girls are sexually tra trafficked into lives of prostitution, and some of these girls are sold by their own families, whether that's because they are impoverished and that is the only form of currency they have is their daughters, or again, um, where daughters just are not seen as um, something that is worth having, that they, they are not worthy of um, being a part of the family as opposed to their sons. Um, also, there's uh, in the United States, 50 to 80 percent of women have been sexually harassed, having been stalked, catcalled or made the target of obscene comments. And 10 to 20 percent of adolescent and young adult females report having been sexually assaulted by someone they are dating. And 20 percent of women have been raped. And that is due to culture. Um, in some cultures, uh, it is that those numbers are way higher um, because it's much more normalized for for that for that kind of treatment of women. Um, to occur. And then in other cultures, it's way smaller because um, there's there's much less inequality be between males and females. So um, in countries where income inequality and um, the, the percentage of 
male and female representation in uh, politics and in, um, in, in power, a uh, political power, uh, the, the more those gaps are closed, um, so that the, the closest to equality that, that certain countries have, then, you know, also decreases is the prevalence of sexual abuse or sexual harassment, um, or sexual assault towards women. It's crazy. So the, the more equal they are in, in income and education and political power, the more women are seen as equal and more seen as fully human and just as worthy of being a human as, as men are, then the less likely they are to be physically or sexually harmed by another person. Okay, um, conflict and peacemaking. So um, when aggression, especially emotional and verbal aggression can occur, um, how do we then, and, and conflict arises, how do we then uh, bring about peace? Uh, so first off, um, there's often misperceptions that can happen in conflicts and then polarization can occur. So misperceptions of another group, often a dehumanization nature, are commonly promoted in wartime propaganda and in the rhetoric that accompanies international crises and serve to readily justify aggression. You see it as a battle between good and evil, not um, not just one against the other. Um, it's it's to help those those um, pe those who are fighting and and those who are citizens of that country. Um, to see their conflict with any adversary they may have as not just like a disagreement, but a fight between good and evil so that you know that, okay, well, my side is right. They are, they are the good guys. They are the ones doing, doing good. And so any action that they must take is justified and is good. So a gain for our side is a loss for the other side and vice versa. Um, there's, there's no, you know, middle ground. It's if we win, you lose, um, we can't both win. Um, so that's that. So to start off with misperception and polarization, um, misperceptions can off, often occur because of, um, the way things are spun. And this can lead to um, people believing that conflicts are polarized, that on all sorts of issues, people fall into one of two opposing camps. Um, they overlook the common ground that they share. Um, and so and if, if you're thinking that it's good versus evil, well, then you're not going to feel like you have any common ground. So any violent or aggressive act that that must be done to the other other side is permissible but if you feel like you've got common ground you start to see other people you know that even your adversaries as more human and more worthy of a different type of conflict resolution um and so when 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 your adversaries are, um, when the common ground is overlooked between adversaries, group members systematically overestimate the extremity of their opponent's attitudes and don't come to realize that we actually have a lot in common, whether that's political um, domestically, whether that's um, in wartime with another country, um, whether it's it's a fight that you have with a friend or with, with a significant other. So when you when you um, misperceive someone and then your ideas become, then you become polarized because you're split up, you know, you, you stop talking to that person because um, I just can't believe that they would think that. Well, then your idea of that person, whenever you start to, you know, play scenarios over and over in your head, they become more and more extreme. Um, you overestimate where that person was coming from and so you start to see it as I'm right, you're wrong, not we could both be a little right and be a little wrong. I hope that makes sense. Um, and that, as I feel like this, this happens, especially in politics, reactive devaluation, um, which is a type of um, misperception and polarization. It's attaching less value to an offer in a negotiation once the opposing group makes it. 
So um, you could be saying, well, you're the enemy. So if you made this proposal, it must not be in my my best interest or it must not be morally sound. So if we're talking domestically, you know, maybe you're talking Republicans versus Democrats in, um, let's say, the Senate and they're trying to pass a bill or something like that. And, um, you know, they're, they're, they're may, they may be not in communication with one another at first and someone says, oh, I have an idea, this would be a good idea. And and so they voice it. Um, if So may, maybe a Republican voices voices an opinion or says this, this is what our bill should, should, we wanna pass a bill about this, this topic. Well, if a Democrat would have suggested it, then the Democrats would have liked it. But since a Republican suggested it, then the Democrat is saying, actually, since you are my enemy, since I oppose everything that you stand for, if you made this promote this this proposal, it must not be in my best interest or it must not be morally sound. So I'm going to actually turn you down or shut it down, whatever. I'm not going to vote for it simply because you brought it up, N- not knowing that if someone on, on the same side of the aisle as they were, were to have brought up that same exact thing, they would have said, yes, that is a great idea. But because someone that they oppose, someone who's an adversary, an enemy, some, you know, whatever you want to call them, just because someone who you don't agree with uh, brought it, brings it up, then it makes you want to devalue it and say, no way, no chance, because it's, because this came from you, then I don't want it. Okay, communication and reconciliation. So what happens when this um, misperceptions and um, this polarization occurs? Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about maybe a situation that a lot of you guys have been in if, if you have um, been in any kind of romantic relationship. So often in the heat of conflict or in the aftermath of aggression, adversaries stop communicating and separate from one another such as um, politicians fighting over legislation or a divorced couple going through legal processes. Um, I'm going to take an example of maybe a slightly immature teenage relationship. And so let's say a boyfriend and girlfriend um, are having an argument. Who knows what it's about? But they're having an argument and they just cannot seem to get on the same page and so they stop talking to one another because they're mad at each other. And they're like, I'm going to go hang out with my friends. So the guy goes, hangs out, goes and hangs out with his friends. And the girl goes and hangs out with their, with her friends. And they're both telling their friends the story. But of course they've got their own spin on things because it's, you know, coming from each of their own uh, perceptions and from their vantage point. And you know what their friends are going to say, girl, you're right. Or to, you know, to their, to their girlfriend or to their, to their, to the boyfriend going to say, you're in the right, she's in the wrong. And, and so they're going to, their ideas are going to become further polarized by the people that they are spending their time with. Cause they hear, they get in this echo chamber of you're right, they're wrong. You're right, they're wrong. You're right, they're wrong. So when they come together, um, so because of this, people are more likely to become immersed in echo chambers of opinion populated by like-minded individuals. So as a result, when they come back together, adversaries are less likely to look at issues from perspective other than their own. They don't find the common ground anymore. They can't put it, put themselves in the other person's shoes. Um, they just know that they are more mad than they were to begin when the argument started. And they are more set in the idea that they're right and the other person's wrong. So how can we combat this? How can we combat this misperceptions, which leads to polarization, which leads to cessation of um, communication, which leads to further polarization, which leads to, which leads to not being able to find common ground at all. So um, we need to actively imagine other people's perspectives. If I were in your shoes, what would I think? Or what would I have done? Or what would I have said? If, if the roles were reversed, how would I feel? And that's sometimes that's hard to do, but that is so important um, to kind of bring yourself back down to earth and say, okay, what can I do 
Um, what would I do if I were in this situation? How would I feel? Next is face-to-face -face communication. There's so much that can be misperceived once again over text or over a phone call. So face-to-face -face communication. Communication helps reduce the misperceptions of opponents and paves the way for peacemaking and cooperation. Okay, so those are the two things that I have. I know that's 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 not a ton of uh, a ton of help, um, a ton of advice, but um, that is what the textbook has as um, ways that we can combat um, these these feelings that can lead to aggressive behavior, um, whether that's emotionally, verbally, physically, whatever it is. Okay, that is the end of chapter 13.